It's not often that people apply Freudian analysis to the wave and tidal, tidal industry. But the last time I spoke about the topic which I'll talk to you today, somebody did, in fact, quote Freud. I was speaking at the Renewable UK Wave and Tidal Conference earlier this year, where I posed the question of whether policymakers should necessarily treat wave and tidal energy the same. The response I got was a warning which quoted Freud, beware the narcissism of small differences. Freud argued that neighbouring communities tended to display a kind of vanity by focusing on their differences, becoming obsessed um, by their differentiation. And similarly, it was argued to me um, that the neighbouring technologies of wave and tidal would be displaying an act of vanity if they would be to focusing on their differences in the policy sphere. But that is an argument which I shall challenge. I will argue that the time has come to dare to differentiate policy support for wave and tidal. Let's begin by looking at um, a simplified policy map for wave and tidal. Um, so here we are in Aberdeen and there are, there are three levels of funding really. We've got the EU funding, um, which we've just heard about, um, UK funding support, which Trevor spoke about, and also at a Scottish level, as, as Jan hinted. What I'll do on this um, table is to categorise different policies and colour code them to, to, to show how they treat wave and tidal. So firstly, let's look at the first arrays, the, the funding for the first arrays. Here we have the Mead and MRCF. Now, originally designed, um, this was, uh, they were originally designed um, as being earmarked for wave and tidal, um, and where wave and tidal would compete against each other. So I've coloured them blue. Um, now, obviously, yesterday morning, when I was standing outside Aberdeen Airport, <coughs> shivering with the um, brisk wind, waiting for a shuttle bus that was delayed, there was a very important announcement made at this conference by the Scottish Energy Minister, saying that MRTF was going to be redesigned and redeployed to very much target wave. So obviously I prepared my presentation before that announcement was made, but I'll return to it in my conclusion because it's of high relevance to what I'm arguing today. We then have debt finance. So we've got the Crown Estate. Again, like Mead and MRCF, that's um, funding specifically earmarked for wave and tidal where they're competing against each other. We then have Reef. Um, where wave and tidal are, are one of other technologies which are eligible for support, um, such as district heating. So I coloured that differently. And then we have the market pool, the revenue incentives for um, pre-commercial technologies. As originally designed, the NER 300 is one of these. And like Reef, it's, a, uh, it's um, eligible, well, a range of low carbon technologies are eligible, such as CCS, not just wave and tidal. We then have the renewables obligation, where wave and tidal have the same level of funding on offer. And finally, I've put up there in a different colour to mark that it is different the historic system of rocks funding um, in Scotland for wave and tidal, where wave received higher support by rocks than tidal at three rocks. But the overwhelming picture here is that the vast majority of policies out there tend to treat wave and tidal the same. This has an impact. In fact, recent funding announcements suggest that um, 2013 could be a year when the wave and tidal relationship reaches a crunch point. The evidence um, published by Renewable UK earlier this year um, suggests that the leading tidal projects may be around £300 per megawatt hour, whereas the leading wave projects may be around £400 per megawatt hour. Obviously projects um, vary substantially in cost, but this was based on data submitted to Mead and MRCF. So tidal seems to be slightly more mature, and that's fed into the results of funding rounds. So as Trevor 
um, highlighted. Uh, if, we, if we include Ireland in there, um, tidal beat wave 4-1. If we look at the number of renewable obligation certificates, again, tidal is receiving more than wave. Now, we shouldn't draw too much from this. This is, after all, um, a relatively small sample size. But nonetheless, it seems to be hinting at a trend. And in fact, this issue of Tidal perhaps scooping up all of the funding and the relative maturity of the technologies is something that's very much come to the forefront of attention in current EMR debates as the industry tries to work out what strike prices are appropriate for CFDs. So the risk, or the fear, is that wave energy would be left behind, that it's left swimming against the tide. And that is concerning because there's a lot at stake. Let me remind you of the benefits of wave energy. Firstly, um, we're all aware of the huge export potential. Um, whilst researchers would um, have different ideas about the appropriate methodology for estimating the global resource, what they will all agree on is that it's big. Um, the International Energy Agency estimates that the global resource is between 8,000 and 80,000 terawatt hours per year. The UK and Scotland is well positioned to capitalise on this, to make the most of that export potential. Um, they've seized the first mover advantage. The question is whether they'll choose to retain it. And here, there's something that haunts us all, the ghost of UK wind manufacturing. We've all heard the comparison between Denmark's flourishing wind manufacturing, um, manufacturing industry and the missed opportunity in the UK in the 1980s. It shows the importance of strong and sustained policy support um, for pre-commercial technologies. But in our insistence in lumping wave and tidal together in the same funding bracket, we put those benefits at risk. The time has come to differentiate support. There are two broad ways of doing this. You can change, firstly, the funding type, by which I mean the structure of funding, the way it's delivered, such as pre-construction pre or post-construction funding. There's also the level, how much you're going to pay per megawatt or per megawatt hour. To illustrate this, let's return to um, this initial policy table, but this time I put tidal and wave on the left-hand side. We know, as Trevor said, that the Mead funding's all gone to tidal. And that will serve as a crucial bridge in its journey to EMR. The question is what we need to do for WAVE to similarly get it to that state of red readiness for EMR. And perhaps we need to think more about tailoring support um, to, to WAVE energy. Some of you will have seen the piece that um, we wrote recently in Renews arguing that perhaps we need to consider a MEAD or MRCF round two. Um, and certainly the announcements yesterday um, resonate partly with that. In terms of revenue incentives, we've seen that Tidal seems to be edging ahead of WAVE, which appears to indicate that WAVE would need a higher per megawatt hour payment. So perhaps we do need to think about higher CFDs. Or alternatively, perhaps even better, we need to think about how we can change the type of funding to tailor it to WAVE. So we need to think about how in particular, there might be more scope for capital grant support and how that might be more appropriate for wave energy. Meanwhile, for Tidal, as the um, leading uh, projects go on to demonstrate their, their first arrays, that obviously brings a big capital investment requirement. So do we need to think more carefully about the provision of debt finance for Tidal? What's the role for the Green Investment Bank here? 
Now, different people will have different ideas about what exactly the new funding regime should look like, but the point is that the time has come that we have to start to discuss and debate this. Some people fi find this um, uh, a bit threatening. They, f they feel a bit nervous about the idea of potentially dividing and conquering an industry. And I can understand those concerns. Certainly, um, in, to date, um, the collaboration of the industry has helped them to um, have a louder political voice through working together. But pe people should be reassured. The principle of differentiated support for pre-commercial technologies is already accepted. For instance, in the UK, we have a system of banding for rocks. Um, for example, uh, offshore wind receives twice the level of support of, of onshore wind. So what we're arguing for is the application of an already accepted principle to wave and tidal. And we need to recognise that this does not preclude cooperation in other areas. For instance, in the, the multinational forum of the EU, um, there could be merit in buddying up um, to have a louder voice. For instance, in trying to get wave and tidal listed on the strategic energy technology plan, set plan. There's also potential in, for, for example, in, for collaboration in, in grid and consenting and public engagement issues. Perhaps more fundamentally, people need to realise that the articulation of difference is not a sign of discord. What we're arguing for is the application of an already accepted principle whilst retaining cooperation in other areas. So to sum up, people tend, or historically there's been a tendency, to lump wave and tidal into the same funding bracket, to label them collectively as ocean energy or as marine energy. But as the cost base differs, that's given tidal an advantage which has led to it um, benefiting disproportionately from the funding available. This is concerning because wave energy has great promise. So the time has come to dare to differentiate support for wave and tidal. We need to think of them very much as wave energy and as tidal energy. We need to think more carefully about how to tailor the type and level of support to each set of technology. Until we do this, uh, wave energy, I fear, would struggle very much to commercialise within the UK. So this is not the narcissism of difference. It's the necessity of difference. And that necessity of difference was at the heart of the Scottish Government's announcements yesterday. So let's read what was said. All previous marine energy funding schemes have been open to both wave and tidal projects. We are proposing something very different. My interpretation of this is that this is uh, the Scottish Government very much um, reaffirming um, that it understands the difference between wave and tidal. It's returning to that precedent it set a few years ago when it offered different banding levels of support under the renewables obligation. The question then becomes, how will um, Westminster respond? Because I've talked about the differentiation between wave and tidal are we also seeing a differentiation between Holyrood and Westminster? What will fall out of EMR? In particular, the South West has some fantastic facilities for wave energy development and deployment. But will Westminster back it up with the tailored support that's needed to make wave projects happen? I think the signs are encouraging. Um, Greg Barker um, seems to recognise that this is something to consider. Here's another quote. He, says, he said earlier this year, if and when it is sensible to do so, we will, of course, 
treat the wave and tidal stream sectors separately. Minister, the time is now. Thank you.